Y para enriquecer el debate tenemos a Hugo Bardi. Nos sentamos, por favor. <risa> Hugo es doctor en química, también es físico, trabaja en la Universidad de Florencia y es miembro del Comité Internacional de ASPO, que es la Asociación para el Estudio del, del Picoil. Es un experto en la dinámica de agotamiento de los recursos naturales y va a hablar un poco pues, de las lógicas de choque con los límites biofísicos y enriquecer el debate para la mesa redonda posterior. Así que, Hugo, todo tuyo. Ok, muchas gracias. Uh, siento que no puedo hablar español. Uh, todos aquí pu pueden. Es, es raro. Pero es como es. Uh, excuse me if I will speak in English. <laughs> Unless you prefer me to speak in Italian, but maybe English would be okay. So if you, if you, uh, you have your uh, earphones and uh, let, let me start. Now there is a good thing today that uh, we are in a seminar about petroleum, but I don't have to tell you anything about petroleum because uh, Emilio already told you a lot yesterday and they were, gave an excellent presentation for an hour. You know everything now about petroleum, right? So I don't need to tell you anything about that, just like re resources, as recursos como, como Alicia uh, spoke about that yesterday. So I will tell you a little bit about the biodynamics, biophysical, thermodynamic, that Ferran would like that, <laughs> factors which are taking us to where we, a we, we are. So we are uh, in phase of the Seneca Cliff, el acantilado de Seneca, the Seneca Cliff, which is a typical phenomenon of complex systems. And this is a point that did not come up in the previous discussion, complex systems. So I thought I could tell you something about complex systems to start. And in order to start, I would show you a complex system first. And uh, my co-worker, Aglaya, was so nice to agree to help me, former co-worker. She has worked with me in Italy. Um, this is Aglaya. She's very nice to help me in this presentation. And uh, she is a complex system. <laughs> How do you know that she is a complex system? Well, one thing you can measure her temperature. See, she's hot. She, it's um, in, in terms of temperature, I mean. Um, <laughs> Why is she hot? She has a high temperature because she's dissipating heat in the environment. This is typical of complex systems. She is a system in homeostasis. Homeostasis. She's doing her job of dissipating energy. Good, you're doing it very well. Mm. So, a typical complex system stays in homeostasis, quiet, doesn't do much damage, but is subject to be perturbed. Perturbation. See, this is in the field we call it forcing, una fuerza, forcing. And I can perturb Aglaya, and she does like this, okay? I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. And this is one way the complex systems react. She is actually smarter than this. If I push her, she might not just, but she moves away. And this is the basic of judo. You, you push, and then she goes away, and the pushing force falls. But now suppose you are inspired by George Bush Sr. Then you would say, the way of life of the American people is not negotiable. So in this case, I push you, you are and, <laughs> and you might hurt yourself. So. That's the essence of the Seneca effect. If you try to resist, you risk to fall and to hurt yourself. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Grazie mille, Aglaia. Um, stata gentilissima. Aglaia speaks perfect Italian, by the way. So, so this is the point. You see what we are subjected to collapses. So imagine that the towers could move away from the planes this would not have happened because the towers are rigid and they are subjected to a material collapse. It collapses. Things collapse, but not just material things that you push people, but there are financial collapses because 
This is the 2008 bubble, financial bubble, the mortgage, subprime mortgage bubble, which had this a very rapid collapse because the system wanted to stay. Where nobody wanted to lose money, so they stayed where they were, and market forces were pushing the system until it crashed. The bubble, la burbuja, crashed, exploded. And there are all many cases in which you can have this phenomenon, in which it can hurt a lot, even more than that. In the big market crash, nobody, almost nobody died. But this is Ireland, 1845. And you see here, you start with 8 million people at the peak. Then you have bang, it goes down very quickly. Not everybody died here. A lot of people are missing because they emigrated, but still, in a few years, you have a couple of million people dying of hunger, famine, starvation. So this is another kind of Seneca collapse. Everyone, every system has certain characteristics. Either you resist too much, either you have a chain of of causes and effects which bring the system anyway over the edge. The system goes down and crashes. Yesterday, Emilio showed you this image about the Syrian oil production. Um, he stopped it about here, but the collapse is continuing. You had data up until 2012. Now, if you look at this, see this? Now, everybody tried to explain the collapse saying, well, it is because we, because the revolution, because the war, because of the Takfiri, because of Saudi Arabia, because of the Russians, because of, of um, the, the, the government. In any case, the collapse takes place. And uh, in this case, the system was strained by the lack of financial resources, as you said yesterday, because the government, the system, could not produce anymore enough oil to export it. And you lost, they lost the revenues from export, and so they crashed. And they're still crashing badly, it continues. So, there are lots of examples, you can, you can enjoy that, but I'm not going to go too much. But there is a general point that I call the Seneca Cliff, this kind of behavior of complex systems. Change can change, can be a lot, can be more, can be a different shape. More or less, this is the idea. Why do I call it the Seneca Cliff? Because, because uh, I think that uh, the Roman philosopher Seneca was the first who noted this um, idea that you've noted, everybody knows this, that it, when things go wrong, they go wrong fast. To put together something, it takes a lot of time. You put together a company, a, a government, a friendship, a marriage, then everything goes down rapidly. If you like, you can also read it in, in Latin. So we have another, another language. Another, we are all Latin, Spanish and Italian are Latin languages. I don't, know, I don't know if you can read Latin like this. But anyway, it is the origin. Then everything now is in English. So it's all right. So Seneca had this idea. And uh, I wrote an entire book on it, which is going to appear in English. End of, Ju end of June, and in German. Maybe there will be an edition in French. I don't know if in Spanish, maybe. There are so many books around. I don't know, maybe you would like to read it. Anyway, this, I've been working a lot on this, as you may imagine. So, you can mention qualitatively the fact that the Seneca effect exists. It's a nice name, it's caught on the, on the web. If you look over the web, you'll find the Seneca effect everywhere. Everybody's talking about that, but now we have to, to say something about that. What causes it? And you could see the, an experiment. Experimentally, we can see the Seneca effect by pushing a lady in, uh, in a certain direction, or a man is the same, but uh, it has to do with the way complex systems behave. When I teach this so to my students, I make this example of uh, Amelia the amoeba because really it is biological. Humans and uh, bacteria and amoebas and uh, simple populations behave very much in the same way. So suppose, imagine you're an amoeba, 
Can you imagine that? Can you reason like a bacterium? Maybe you can try. So you want to grow. And uh, in time, you will grow as much as the available resources allow you. But as we have been saying today, yesterday, there are limits to the resources. So the fact that there are limits to the resources will affect the growth mechanism, which can take different shapes. Seneca is not actually the worst. Hokusai is the worst because you are, you are really taken away, but a giant wave that crashes on you. But that's, that could be modelized by mathematics, I think, but let's not go into that. So we start from very simple models, biodynamics models. You have bacteria, bacteria grow, and you see this is typical of biological populations and of the economy, they, it tends to grow exponentially. This is a relatively new discovery because as we've been saying, growth is fundamental for the economy, just as it is fundamental for a bacterial colony. And uh, this typically takes place in this, which is called the Petri dish. And you see that it is, it is limited. There is a limit here. And uh, there is a history of the human consciousness of the existence of limits. And it is a very old story because the very first to note the existence of limits was Thomas Malthus. Malthus, you know the story, right? He was the one who predicted disasters and famines and starvation and mass death and everything. Actually, Malthus gave a, a fundamental contribution to human thought, which was what we call today the carrying capacity, fundamental concept, which is modern. Modern, because for modern and new for economists, economists don't know about it. Any economists here? I'm sorry. But for the economists, this line here does not exist. For physicists, chemists, biologists, natural scientist, it exists, it was discovered for the first time by Malthus. Note that Malthus never predicted the catastrophes, which is probably not something that you know because Malthus is known today as having foreto foretold a catastrophe that didn't occur. Malthus never predicted catastrophes. He thought, well, we grow, we arrive to the limit, and there we stay. Why we stay there? Because people starve, because they die of, of uh, sickness, because they, there are wars and epidemics, all that. But he didn't think of collapse. He didn't know about collapse. He never wrote about collapse. He wrote before the Ireland famine, and he could not imagine that Ireland would have lost half of its population in a few years. He said, well, they are, they are too many, noted. We must help them uh, build industries, make them uh, live at a higher uh, prosperity. But he could not imagine the catastrophe that was coming. And so Malthus was an optimist, as you probably didn't know that. So then there came uh, Hubbard, who is an, uh, was an empiricist, and he thought, well, this is more like bacteria. Bacteria grow, run out of food, and then they die. If you are a bacteria, that's what you do normally. If you are human beings, actually very much the same, but let's go slowly into that. And then back in 1971, it was the work of Jay Forrester, which I think you didn't hear. Maybe you know about Forrester. Well, you know, Aglaia, you, you got to know that. Forrester was a genius of the 20th century. He applied the concept overshoot, overshoot means going over to socioeconomic systems. It was a big jump in knowledge because this is also completely unknown to economists. Economists, at best, they can admit that there is a limit, but they cannot admit that it will pass it because economics is all based on a short term equilibrium. You always, you always move along your limit, but you don't, you're not supposed to overcome the limit. If you overcome the limit, 
then you go down faster. This is what Seneca was saying. In a sense, Forrester was an intellectual heir of Seneca, maybe, but I don't think he knew about Seneca. Anyway, now we have this concept, which is modern, typical of the ecological movement, overshoot and collapse, and then we can apply it, and we have to quantify it. And I tend to use this example here, humans, bacteria, lions, why not? All, all the same constraints. You notice in the Spanish, maybe in English it is famous. Did you ever hear this in, in English? Every morning a gazelle wakes up and knows that it has to run faster than the lion, otherwise she will die. Every morning the lion wakes up and knows that he has to run faster than the gazelle, otherwise he will die of starvation. You have that. It is so typical in the United States. It's like it means you had a businessman, you had to work harder every day to make your company grow and you'll become rich. And then you retire and then you die. But that's, that's not a problem. So what is the problem of the lion? Problem of energy. Because the lion, in order to run, needs energy. And where does it get the energy from the gazelle? It's exactly what Emilio was saying yesterday, the concept of eroi, energy return on energy invested, which in Spanish you say tre, tasso de retorno energetico. And <coughs> this is what, what Emilio showed yesterday. Uh, correctly, we are around here. And as we run out gradually of gazelles, if you are a lion, you're worried about gazelles. If you are human, you're worried about petroleum. Then you go down this cliff. And when you are here, you are dead. The point that uh, we can go a little bit beyond what Emilio said yesterday. Now, this is, a, this is the problem. Now, how do we move along this curve? what speed, what happens along the trajectory. That's, that can be modeled. We can make models. And uh, I'm not going to go into much detail into this, but there is a whole branch of science, which is called system dynamics, which was developed by Jay Forrester, the one that I was showing before in the 1950s and the 1960s, which deals with the kinetics of dissipation of thermodynamic potentials. Its potentials are often represented in terms of a bathtub, which is a stock of gravitational energy, because you can flow. Flow, you have energy, you open up the, the plug, and the potential will be dissipated by flowing through, down. You can use a, you use a, a system of a, representation of the system, which is conventional, is, is a complete field of science. Did you know this? No? Never heard of you? Hmm. OK, some, uh, some of you did. So you can manage this, and you can model lions and gazelles. It's actually, this is not a lion, but it's OK. Never mind. It's the same. So you have a stock of energy which is gazelle, you have a stock of energy, which is lions. The job of a lion is to transform gazelles into lions, right? And you can, you can analyze this, assuming that the lion uh, does exactly as in the story, runs as fast as he can, it can, and the gazelle runs as fast as he can. The problem for the lion, one of the problems, for, for, I'm sure the lion has lots of problems, but one of the problems is that as you kill the gazelles, there are less gazelles around, so it becomes more difficult to catch them. So you can model this, and the result will be something like this. The bell-shaped curve, Hubbard curve, peak oil, civilization collapse. Civilization collapse because they run out of resources. As Alicia was telling us, maybe we go down through a spiral, as you said, or faster. It depends. Depends on various parameters, but that's you see. It depends of um, mainly depends on the error, on the tray, because that affects the efficiency with which the 
civilization or the lion can process resources like oil or gazelles, transforming them into an useful energy. And uh, this works actually. It, uh, for many things, many, many things, you can have, uh, you can model the whole economic system and fit various cases, industrial cases, um, like whaling. Whaling is uh, whale hunting. Como se dice en español, la balena. La casa, la balena. And this is, the, by the way, the first time that I tried this model on something real. It worked beautifully at the first attempt. And then uh, we found it was not so easy, not always so easy, but, but you see, you, can, you have this behavior. The job of whalers is to transform whales into whale oil, which then is transformed into more whalers through the financial system, because you sell the oil, and with the money you buy new ships pay the salary to the wares and so on. So the system is very, it's very simple, but it's unbelievable how well it works. Everybody, people say the systems are very complicated. They are. But there is a core. There is a, an inner logic in systems. And systems, once you see the system is in thermodynamics terms, you see that the systems always behave in a predictable way. They dissipate energy. There is a, a fourth principle of thermodynamics that says systems tend to dissipate entropy as fast as possible. The faster, the better, if they can. So it works, but I'm not going into details, but I just wanted to tell you something more. What is the problem of lions? Lions have lots of problems. Lots of problems. Not just that there are not enough gazelles. One of the big problems of lions is that there are other lions. You are in competition with other lions, and you are in competition with the hyenas. You have to feed the cubs. You have to, to run away from, from safari hunters trying to take pictures of you. So in reality, the system is a little more complicated. It's more like this, you see. Gazelle, leopards, lions, and maybe competitors, hyenas or maybe other lions, or maybe tourists taking pictures of you. So if you go like this, you make this, which at this point, those of you who studied biology, I think you recognize what this is. It's a trophic chain. Species one, species two, species three, and so on. You have a trophic chain, which is a concept that in biology is not so often explained in thermodynamic terms, but it is the way ecosystems dissipate entropy as fast as they can. And now you solve this, you very general, and you get the Seneca cliff. That's the output of that model, which is, again, very general. If you, in this case, I've applied it to the economy, and this parameter here is pollution which may even be, if you like, climate change, because climate change is putting a strain on the economy, just like the running gradually out of resources. So the, the reason for the Seneca cliff in this case is that, is that uh, the economy is strained from two sides, lack of resources, pollution, which is doing damage to the economy, because you have to allocate some resources to fight pollution. And that's very general, very, very general. You can do this in more complex manners like this, like a word model. You can make six stocks, 100 stocks, if you like. But the interaction is always the same. Every stock, energy stock, petroleum, energy, um, agriculture, humankind, as always, takes resources from another stock, transforms into another a stock of pollution. Okay, and then this is the result that you all know have been mentioned last uh, yesterday: the limits to growth. Now, as I said at the beginning, there are always limits to growth. Everybody knows that there are limits to growth, 
but by means of thermodynamics and of the implementation of thermodynamics, which is known as system dynamics, you can model, try to understand, not necessarily predict, because prediction is always difficult, but you can see that the system is, tends to grow and then collapse rapidly, Seneca style. That was in 1972. The concept of Seneca cliff had not been invented yet, but you can see this, you know this, right? So this is a tendency, is not, is not a prediction. It's a tendency. The system will tend to, to go, to arrive to a certain point, possibly around where we are now, 2020, more or less. Don't take it as a prediction. At some point, resources, energy, services, healthcare, um, pensions, everything that Professor Navarro said can be explained in thermodynamic terms, which means that we are a little bit in trouble because I don't think that socialism can reverse thermodynamics, or uh, at least it is very difficult. So this is the frame in which we are moving and we have to manage, we have to know what we are doing and try to manage it because the system in qualitative terms is going to bring the whole thing to collapse. There is no way to avoid it. Uh, perhaps we should not even try. But uh, Jim Tainter already in the 90s proposed a qualitative explanation of the collapse of societies, which had to do with the increasing, sorry, the decreasing returns of complexity, which is exactly what I was saying, the increasing um, pull of pollution, which in this case you can take as bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is a form of pollution, and you can reproduce it. Uh, for the Roman Empire, you could make measurement, but I'm not be going to the Roman Empire. It's a very interesting example, but say there is a lot of people who are using this model to predict what's going to happen to us, which will not be a gradual decline, but a rapid, destructive, um, terrible, difficult cliff. In addition, also, you have, we have another problem, as you know. We didn't discuss that yesterday, not even today, but we also, we are strained between two constraints, resource depletion and climate change. The result is something like this. Uh, uh, what do we do? I, mm -hmm, that's a good question. Now, this is, the, this is science, you know, science, make measurements, uh, you make models, and then and, and you discover whether it, we have a little problem. Um, but uh, it would be nice if our, if our leaders were able to recognize <laughs> what the problem really is. But, uh, but I, I'm afraid even if they could understand it, I'm assuming that Mr. Trump knows about thermodynamics, I don't think change, things would change a lot because really the system is moving by itself. So the best we can do, I think, is to try to follow the system, not to force the system because the system has a way to react. And uh, we, do you see this? I wrote this also. <laughs> we, one good thing that we could do is renewable energy to go down that spiral that Alicia was mentioning yesterday. But uh, again, again, it's, uh, it's very difficult because the situation is really, is really moving in a direction that nobody understands, except in terms of creative disruption. So Seneca, the Seneca cliff is a problem, but it is also a solution. If you can destroy something that bothers you, then other systems, other parts of the systems can be saved. So let me make you an example. This is a study that we made with my co-workers. See the Seneca Cliff here? The Seneca Cliff is about fossil fuels. Now, is this bad that fossil fuels go down so fast? No, because it saves us from climate change, mainly, hopefully. 
but if we don't want to lose energy and everybody dies of lack of energy, then we must replace it. And you can calculate how fast the collapse has to be and how much you must invest in order to replace the energy that you lose in terms of fossil fuels. You replace them with renewable energy. And uh, I, can, I think you, you're looking with the kind of face that uh, clearly shows that you understand that it's not going to be easy, right? You, you're making this... Uh, you, you, yeah, I can see. I, you know, when you give talks in English, Italian, Spanish, never. In French, I can give a talk if you are interested. Um, you read the minds of the people in the audience. I do. I, I won't say everything that you're thinking. No, don't worry about that. <laughs> but you think, this is not possible. Yes, it is not possible. It's no way that we can, it needs that we need to increase investments in renewable energy, renewable infrastructure, circular economy, efficiency, um, waste management of at least a factor of 10 with respect to what we are doing now. But actually, a factor of 10 is not enough. We need about a factor of 50, almost a factor of 100. And we are not going to do this. I, I can imagine myself going to see Mr. Trump and say, Mr. Trump, we have this problem. Well, yeah, okay, we have to make America great again. Yeah, okay, that we need to invest in, to increase invest. Yes, I'm investing in uh, increasing investment in the military industry and extracting coal. Mr. President, I'm sorry. This is not going to, I uh, know I am investing in extracting coal. Coal would make America great again. Mr. President, I'm sorry, we have some thermodynamics. What is thermodynamics? And, and a problem of entropy, entropy. Um, Will never, will never work, but it's not so much a fault to Mr. Trump, but the whole society is not um, understanding. It's very difficult for us to understand. We have to make sacrifices for the future, and mm -hmm. but in a sense, in a sense, it is reacting, also reacting in the, in the right way, because the Seneca Cliff is not just this huge global cliff, but also minor cliffs like this one. Okay. That's uh, very recent, is a study that was presented um, a couple of weeks ago by this rethink think tank. It says, you see the Seneca Cliff. Seneca Cliff of what? Ownership of cars. So according to these people who are not catastrophists, uh, not leftist, communists, uh, subversives, and uh, things like that, we are going to see a rapid and destructive collapse in car ownership, which, and you see the black is stranded, means that you still have cars, old cars, junk cars that you will not use because you won't know what to do with them. You don't have gasoline, you don't have a, um, a way to pay for the taxes, and then you will not be allowed to, dri to, to drive cars. Human-driven cars are going to be forbidden very soon, because humans are a bit dangerous as drivers, as we all know. So that's, that's the way TAS means, means uh, transport as a service. It means that when you need a car, you don't go to your garage, you press a button on your cell phone, and the self-driven car will glide slowly in front of you, you enter and the car takes you wherever you want. If you can afford it, if you have access to credit, if you still have a credit card, then it will work like that. Note, this is very interesting because this story, read it because it's extremely interesting, is framed in the idea of growth. They say, oh, well, the number of cars will go down, but since TAS is so much more efficient than individual car ownership, then the number of miles will increase. And so everybody will be happy. It is growth. Everything. If you want to, if you want to sell this, you have to tell people we're still growing. TAS is a way to keep growth. Because there is no other kind of discourse that you can make except growth. As somebody said, it is no, no other <laughs> way of discussing. Because you say no growth, you are out out of the conversation. We are, um, we are um, subversives, as you know. You know what you are, right? Because you are here. But if you read it carefully, 
You see what it means. They understand it. They don't say it, but it is clear. If you read between the lines, as people say, this means taking away cars from people. Because people are consuming a lot of energy, resources, and uh, they are dangerous also. So this is a reform which will uh, revert the Fordism. Fordism, you know Fordism, is that uh, workers make car that they themselves buy. Because of the inversion of the crisis, the recursos uh, of the energy and resource crisis, this doesn't work anymore. It's the end of Fordism. Workers cannot afford their cars anymore. No more Volkswagen car for the people. No more Volkswagen here. It's also because of the diesel gate, but that's another story. And uh, they are telling you everybody will be happy. No, the rich will be happy. The poor will have to work, which is anyway probably unavoidable given the situation. You will still have transportation as much as you can afford to the extent you can afford it. And if you are poor, you will be able to afford very little. But in principle, say, okay, what is the problem? You can still buy the service. You, don't, you cannot afford a car anymore. You can still buy, rent a car, okay, when you can, if you can. I see the system moves by bumps, not gradually. This is one of the factors which, in a sense, is positive because it eliminates one of the main sources of waste, energy, materials, and, and um, resources in general, which is transportation. So the system adapts, like when I was pushing Aglaya, in some, case, in some cases, the system is dumb, tries to resist, and then eventually collapses. In some cases, it moves a little bit away and adapts. That's a form of adaptation. And in the end, I think I would like to conclude. Whatever we do, we've been discussing a lot of things today, but I was discussing about Seneca. Seneca was a Stoic, one of the first representatives of the school of the Stoics. I think there are still Stoics in the world. I consider myself one of that school. And uh, the main point that uh, one Stoic named Epictetus said, is you change what you can change, and the rest you take, is, you take it as this comes. Like, like when I push you, try to avoid it, but if you have to fall, you try to fall and roll and, and stand up again. And I think, you see, I see this also in this conference, and in the debate in general. I'm sure you participate in this debate. There are two lines of thought. There's nothing we can do. There is no problem. And as I tell you, we need to increase investments of a factor of 50. You, tell, you will probably tell me there is nothing we can do. Or you simply will disbelieve me. Why should we do that? We don't believe you. There is no problem. Well, OK, so we do. We start working. And we try to do what we can because, because we want what we want. But we get what we get. And I would like to conclude with some words by Marcus Aurelius, another Stoic. I think he was much more intelligent than Mr. Trump. At least this shows that he understood thermodynamics perfectly. I think this is a great way to express the concept of the fourth principle of thermodynamics, which is the tendency of system to dissipate entropy. It's written here. Emperor Marcus Aurelius understood, but still he couldn't save the Roman Empire. <laughs> so there is little that the man on top can do. And uh, with this, I would like to thank some people here who have helped me in this in this kind of work. If you like to publish your some something on this subject, we, I am an editor of this journal, and you can look at my blog also here. Or there is an a discussion forum that if you ask me, I can insert you in. And uh, if you want to 
go deeper in this. We are organizing this school in Florence this September. If you are interested, I think it will be very interesting. And you are welcome to apply. The number of uh, uh, places is limited, but I think uh, not so limited that, uh, that it, no, it's not exclusive. If you apply, you will be welcome to come and to listen to uh, a number of old, pe old people, oh, sorry, a number of old people who will tell you stupid things, or maybe not so stupid. So thank you very much for your attention. question in Spanish, I, will, I, I, I hope that I will be able to understand it. If not, I will translate it into Italian. Bien. Uh, uh, Malthus, que usted habló de Malthus, uh, hubo después una, una, pol una polémica entre Malthus y Marx. Entonces, uh, uh, Pienso que la, Malthus eh, no, no analizaba las condiciones políticas y económicas de su tiempo, las consideraba inmutables. Mientras que Marx, no es que contradiciera a Malthus, pero él veía que también dependía de, de una, el, un, el, el consumo, la, el crecimiento de la población, dependía, dependía también de, de condiciones de explotación. Entonces, eh, ahí es el problema. Y es decir, cuando se analiza así en extracto un poco eh, la repercusión que tiene eh, la energía, la escasez de recursos sobre una sociedad, hay que decir, por ejemplo, qué sociedad es esa. Por ejemplo, el capitalismo, hay estudios que dicen que el 40% de la comida se, se malmete. Hay la obsolescencia programada. Hay una, una capacidad de, de, dentro de, incluso del, del sistema de ahorrar energía y recursos impresionante. Pero es verdad que la lógica del sistema, eh, como decía Walter Benjamin, eh, es una lógica que el sistema no, no tiene aturador, no tiene, él mismo no sabe refrenarse si va hacia la catástrofe. El sistema capitalista es a corto plazo. Entonces yo pienso que eh, lo que tenemos que hacer es eh, evitar la catástrofe de alguna manera y eh, hacer, contar la verdad a la gente de, lo, de, lo que, de dónde nos lleva el sistema. No hay que callarse nada, pero al mismo tiempo eh, pues, inte, inte, decirles que dentro del sistema no hay salvación, que hay que cambiar hacia otro sistema, porque yo pienso que el sistema capitalista no es reformable. Yes, good point, exactly. This is another point, however. Malthus, I've, I've spoken about Malthus from a biophysical viewpoint, which stops at some moment, at some point. Then, once you understand the story of the lack of resources, then there starts the problem of the distribution of the resources, which is what Marx was criticizing of Malthus, exactly, uh, absolutely. And we saw this in the, in the talk this morning, where um, Professor Navarra told us about another, line, another aspect of the same problem. How do we distribute the resources facing, um, como se dice, an escasez, an escasez de recursos? A lack of resources. So, and uh, you, we can model that too, but it's more iffy, more difficult. Essentially, what happens in the model is that society splits in two, and uh, you have a predator, which is the cap capitalism, and you have a prey, which is people. And then, uh, and then, the predator takes everything and the people starve. Um, I, I don't know how it can be avoided. This is not something that uh, I did beyond 
what I, will, I wanted to discuss today, then it's another kind of, of subject, political, which uh, it's extremely interesting. I was, um, I was discussing before with a gentleman here, and then there is a, there is a. But let's let's not start this. Maybe we discuss it in another um, occasion. Well, I think it's uh, expanding the. Me dicen que tengo que hablar en castellano. Eh, digo que... Eh, vamos a ver, es que eh, la crítica va más allá que tiene incluso que ver con el Club de Roma, que creo que están profundamente equivocados. Vamos a ver, eh, usted dice de que el socialismo no lo va a arreglar, pero vamos a ver, usted ahora dice... No, 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 usted no dijo eso. Usted dijo que el socialismo no iba a arreglarlo. Esto es distinto. Entonces, vamos a ver. Uh, en la respuesta que ha dado, dice, o es que el socialismo tiene que ver con la distribución. No es cierto. Tiene que ver también con la producción. O sea, en este aspecto, el punto clave es que, con todo el respeto, su presentación me ha parecido interesante desde el punto de vista de ingeniería social, pero extremadamente ingenuo políticamente. ¿Me explico? O dice, oh, eso yo no lo toco. Oiga, pues no Ingeniería estoy... social, exactamente. Pero, exacto, pero exacto. Pues el problema del Club de Roma. O sea, que en ese aspecto usted dice, mire, esto es esencial, pero no lo toco. Hombre, pues mire usted, es que es esencial, sin eso no se lo el otro. ¿Me explico? Es que me parece obvio. Entonces, desde el punto de vista, dice, bueno, las soluciones, pero cuando le dicen usted de que es que eh, 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 hay que resolverlo, ¿Cómo ir de aquí para allá? Es una pregunta política. Y no puede decir, oh, esto es para los políticos. Oh, no, no, es que no se puede. La otra cosa es que Malthus era profundamente reaccionario. Que además se ha mostrado, no, déjeme, que acá, eh, se mostró claramente que estaba profundamente equivocado. Uh, no hablo de colapso, pero dijo que las poblaciones tenían un límite debido a la limitación de recursos. Profundamente equivocado. Mire usted, ahora, hoy en el mundo, hay más que suficiente alimento para, a, para alimentar a 20 veces la población que hay en el mundo. O sea, que no es la falta de alimento. Y Malthus decía que esto era inevitable, que tendría una limitación. ¿Por qué se equivocó? Precisamente porque no tuvo en cuenta lo que no estaba tomando en cuenta, que la producción es una categoría política. Y entonces eh, había, como muy bien decía Marx a Malthus, mire usted, usted no puede decir que hay una limitación considerando un contexto estable que no lo es. ¿Me explico? Entonces, es ahí de que eh, eh, si el capitalismo eh, es la raíz del problema en cuanto a, a que el, la acumulación de capital se convierte en el principio de aquel sistema, eh, es obvio que la solución pasa por una alternativa uh, y que ese es el proyecto pero no puede decir, oh, es que esto es política esto es lo que los políticos no, no, oiga, es que lo que usted nos está diciendo es un buen camino para llegar allá pero el punto clave, ¿cómo se llega allá? y usted no puede lavarse las manos y decir, no, no, esto es político Sí, uh, absolutamente uh, I understand the point uh, only just, uh, there's uh, two different planes One is uh, social engineering, as, uh, as you correctly said. This is an uh, engineering view because Forrester, the founder of all this, was an engineer. He was a mechanical engineer. And he took the formulas, the ideas, the concepts of engineering, and he applied them to society. It's uh, not everybody agrees with this approach, I understand. And uh, or just, but I understand perfectly, with different planes, Of, of action, different planes of view, different way of seeing the same thing. Only thing I, I care about as a personal opinion is that Malthus, I, I, well, you can use the, the word reactionary, as you said, maybe take into account that he was writing in late 18th century. So that was a different way of seeing the world. You could see he was, uh, today, if you take what he wrote, At face value, you say Malthus was a racist, absolutely, because he was discussing the inferior races, which are the non-Europeans and things like that. But that's a cultural 
factor of his time. Everybody at the time was thinking like this. The blacks are obviously inferior to the whites. And he was influenced by this, this climate. But Malthus was a pastor. He was a reverend, a priest, if you like. And he never advocated killing or exterminating or things like that. He was personal. You can see it from what he writes. He was sorry about what he was saying. He, as a man of, of a, a religious man, he saw this as a tragedy. And he tried to write in order, maybe there is a way to avoid it. Then he, he was a pessimist, like many of us are. And so he could not find a way. But he was a man of conscience. He was a ethically oriented person. And it was, in my opinion, it was criticized wrongly for things that it is typical. You are always criticized for things you never said. <laughs> it's so typical. So, um, Okay, thank you for the question. Eh, como vamos un poco fuera de tiempo, vamos a parar ahora, 15 minutos de descanso y seguimos después un solo comentario para intentar tender puentes. Creo que es más o menos obvio que el socialismo no puede ir en contra de la termodinámica, pero también es obvio que el socialismo es imprescindible para gestionar las implicaciones de la termodinámica. Yo creo que a partir de ahí es un punto de encuentro que luego podremos seguir explorando. <risa>